Friends, the Lord be with you. Good morning and welcome to Second Christian Reformed Church on this Labor Day weekend. Welcome to any visitors that we have with us, including the Bexfords who are helping lead us in worship this morning. We invite all of you to join us outside in the front for a time of coffee and cookies uh, after the service. If you are a visitor, uh, we'd love to get to know you more and invite you to look for the welcome sign that will be outside for you to find someone to talk to and so we can get to know you. I invite you to rise in body or in spirit and receive these words of greeting this morning from the God who has called us here to this place. Grace, mercy, and peace be yours in abundance from God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and all God's people said, Amen. As God has greeted us, I invite you to extend a fist or elbow or wave as we pass the peace of Christ to one another this morning. to God. How precious is your steadfast love, O God. All people may take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house, and you give them drink from the river of your delight. For with you, God, is the fountain of life, and in your light we see light. Friends, let's worship God. Every mouth that cries for food, every lung that yearns for breath, every eye that searches through the dark will light. All creation looks to you for its breath and for its food. From the goodness of your hand we satisfy. Rejoice in all your works, King of heaven, King of earth. Every creature you have made declares your praise. We rejoice in all you made, God of all. Rejoice in all your works, King of heaven. 
be seated. Psalm 126 begins by looking backward, recalling a day when God had showed his faithfulness to Israel, how he saved them, how they rejoiced. When the Lord brought, brought back the captive ones, we were like those who dreamed. They remember God's goodness in the past in order to ask him to show up today. So they say, restore our fortunes, O Lord. May those who sow in tears reap with shouts of joy. They were asking to be brought back from exile for their homes to be rebuilt in the land that the Lord gave them. Restore us, O God. We might ask for the end of the pandemic, for the calming of the wildfires and the storms and the floods, for the reconciliation of a fragmented people. And the gospel promises us that we will see the goodness of God sometime before the end. So would you pray with me? God who provides, you have been good to us beyond anything we could have deserved. You breathed into the dust and gave us life. In your generosity, you gave us light and joy and fulfillment. Because of your love, our mouths have been filled with laughter and our tongues with shouts of joy but our smiles falter when we remember our sins against you, our failure to love our neighbor, our readiness to hold a grudge, our tendency to walk our own path away from the table you set for us. Through Christ our Lord we pray, have mercy on us. Father of all, we lament the suffering that abounds in the earth. We remember and lift up to you these burdens that are too heavy for us to carry, the virus that has taken too many lives, the crisis of division that has torn into our communities, and the violence that harms the innocent and the peaceful in places like Afghanistan, Yemen, and Syria. Truly, the powers of evil have not slept, but Scripture reminds us that you, O God, do not sleep either. You keep watch over the weak and lowly. You guard the orphan, the widow, and the refugee. Show yourself, O Lord, and soon. Through Christ our Lord, we pray, have mercy on us.
And our words of assurance today are spoken. We'll hear some sung in a moment. In Psalm 36, the psalmist says to God, How precious is your steadfast love, O God. All people may take refuge in the shadow of your wings. And now I invite you to listen to prayer for today. in the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven and given new lives and then called to serve in spite of all that is wrong. Uh, And we are told several times in Scripture and uh, through the goodness of community and through the preaching of the Word, we can hear Jesus saying to us that our labor is not in vain, that we are called to serve for a purpose, and it is the best purpose, the building of God's kingdom. The song we're about to sing is called Your Labor is Not in Vain, and it embodies that message. Um, I invite you to listen to the first verse, and then I'll invite you to sing along if you'd like, uh, but at least to be open uh, to hear the goodness of that truth that your labor is not in vain. Your labor is not in vain Though the ground underneath you is cursed and stained 
Your planting and reaping are never the same, but your labor is not in vain. And we'll sing verse one again, if you back up the slides. Two, three. Your labor is not in vain, though the ground underneath you is cursed and stained, your planting and reaping are never the same, your labor is not in vain. Time, I would invite any kids who are here with us ages five and under to follow Miss Emily out for walkout worship.
Would you pray with me? Good and gracious God, we thank you for your word, your word that nourishes and sustains us, that challenges and that comforts us. Give us ears to hear and hearts to receive your word, not mine, not ours, but yours, for you alone are God. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Our scripture reading this morning comes from Nehemiah chapter 4, the first six verses. Now when Sanballat heard that we were building the wall, he was angry and greatly enraged, and he mocked the Jews. He said in the presence of his associates and of the army of Samaria, what are these feeble Jews doing? Will they restore things? Will they sacrifice? Will they finish it in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of rubbish and burned ones at that? Tobiah the Ammonite was beside him, and he said, that stone wall they're building, any fox going up on it would break it down. Hear, O our God, for we are despised. Turn their taunt back on their own heads and give them over as plunder in a land of captivity. Do not cover their guilt and do not let their sin be blotted out from your sight, for they have hurled insults in the face of the builders. So we rebuilt the wall, and all the wall was joined together to half its height, for the people had a mind to work. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. After doing a long, continuous series this summer, I thought it would be fun this fall to mix things up and hop around the Bible, taking a selection of lectionary passages and then also observing some of the calendar days which we don't always pay attention to in the church, like Labor Day. There's nothing strictly religious, of course, about Labor Day, but a lot of churches use this weekend as an opportunity to talk about themes of work and labor and stewardship, and I thought we'd give it a go. And as I was looking at various texts to use this morning, I came across Nehemiah 4. And we don't do a whole lot with the book of Nehemiah. I've never preached on it before. And I think only three of the 13 chapters are listed in the lectionary. It's not a super common text. And it's, it's seen as the sequel to the book of Ezra, which comes right beforehand. And to understand today's text, then, we need to spend a bit of time setting up some of the backstory. The Israelites, one day I'm going to quiz you on this because I feel like I say it a lot. The Israelites were taken into exile in Babylon in 587 BC. One day, I will ask for congregational response to that. <laughs> 587 BCE. And then a small remnant, though, remained in the city of Jerusalem and the surrounding land of Judah. They were, they were able to stay behind. And Judah then became a Babylonian province that was then called Yehud, over which was placed a governor who was a native of Judah, but who served Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians. In 539, because remember BC time goes bigger year to smaller year, so in 539, Cyrus the Great of Persia conquered Babylon. And the next year, he issued a decree allowing the Jews to return to their homeland. So we get the first return of the exiles, led by a man named Zerubbabel, which wasn't just the one kind of week-long mass exodus. This stretched over a period of 23 years as people slowly trickled from Babylon back to Judah and Jerusalem. That period culminates with the rebuilding of the temple. In 458 BC, a second bigger group uh, is led back to Judah by Ezra. And then about a decade later, around 444, we meet Nehemiah. Nehemiah serves as the cupbearer to Artaxerxes I, who had ascended the Persian throne two years prior. 
And one day, Nehemiah meets a group of Jews who are coming from Jerusalem and visiting the capital city of Susa. And they tell him about Jerusalem and how the city is mostly in ruins, particularly the city wall, whether from the original sacking of the city a century beforehand or from more recent attacks from some of their adversaries like the Samaritans and the Ammonites. And place, city, capital, that's always been closely associated to the state of the people for the ancient Israelites. The state of Jerusalem is seen as significantly connected to the fate of the people. If Jerusalem flourishes, so the people will flourish. But if the city lies in ruin, so the people live in shame and disarray. So when Nehemiah hears this report about the state of the city, he is troubled, and he's convicted to do something. Like Esther, he uses his high position in the king's court to his advantage. And one day when he feels like the time is right, he goes to Artaxerxes and asks him for permission to travel to Jerusalem for a period of time so that he might help the people rebuild the city walls. Artaxerxes gives him his blessing, and so Nehemiah travels with an armed escort and laden down with timber that Artaxerxes had given him, and he travels to Yehud, to Judah. As he travels, this is in chapter 2, we're introduced to two characters— Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite. Sanballat is the governor of Samaria, which is one of Judah's chief rivals, and Tobiah is an Ammonite official, another one of Israel's arch enemies. And Samaria and Ammon at this point are also Babylonian prov- or Persian provinces, but Again, each province still retains its own culture and history and pride, and Sanballat and Tobiah are none too pleased that Artaxerxes was allowing the Jews to rebuild their city and gain back some of their prestige. They quite liked having Judah on the lowest rung of the provincial ladder. And Nehemiah knows of this threat, but he pushes on, arriving at Jerusalem where he takes stock of the situation. He travels around the city by night so as to go undetected. Things are as bleak as he had heard. The wall is in ruins, and the heaps of rubble and rubbish are so high in some places that he can't actually get over them. It's a daunting task that lies ahead. But he gathers the people together and tells them of his plan and invites them to rebuild the city walls, which they jump to with enthusiasm. And so we come to our text today. Sanballat has gotten word that the work has begun and he blows a gasket. Now, the trick, of course, is that Sanballat can't officially do anything about this. He is still a subject of Artaxerxes, who has given the project his blessing. I don't think Sanballat much fancied risking an actual attack on the city quite yet. So he just yells and stomps about for a while in front of his colleagues, pretending to be in charge, mocking the Jews for their efforts. Are they really going to rebuild this wall? Do they think their God is going to do it for them? Is that why they keep making these sacrifices? Do they think it's going to happen overnight? Do they actually think they can take that heap of rubbish and turn it into something? Tobiah, who kind of seems like the kind of sidekick who really wants to be cool and powerful but isn't, so he associates himself with someone who is and just parrots them, he chimes in after this with his own jibe. Oh yeah, he says, that wall is so shaky a measly fox could knock it over. Well, word of this mockery of these taunts gets back to Nehemiah, 
and he's concerned. He's concerned enough to bring it up with the Lord. At this point, all Sanballat and Tobiah have are mocking words, but there's threat looming behind those words. And Nehemiah knows that such threats could stir up fear in the people so that they'll retreat back into their homes. Or, he knows, those threats could be realized. Sanballat could say, I'll deal with Artaxerxes later, and he could decide to go after the Jews. And either way, the work of rebuilding won't get done. So he prays. You and I are also in the building business. Maybe not city walls, but each one of us is called to be a builder, a worker in the kingdom. And right away, of course, we have to remind ourselves that we build nothing on our own, except that the Lord build the house, says Psalm 127. They labor in vain that build it. God is the architect, the master planner, the power behind the power tools, the very foundation upon which the walls of the kingdom are built. But just as certainly as we say that God is the true builder, we can also say that he employs us for his purposes. Be fruitful and multiply were the very first words he says to humanity. And fill the earth and subdue it. God created us to be creative agents in the world. And if we humans rather wrecked things right off the bat, laying ruin to the perfect world God had created, in his grace, he yet invites us, through our words and our actions and our relationships, to join him in working towards the vision of the restored and coming kingdom. Every action, a stitch in the tapestry that reveals the kingdom just a little more fully. Every word giving us a glimpse, a, a whisper of God's truth and love and intent for his creation. And on the face of it, when we take a cursory glance around, this seems like a daunting task. The world seems bleak a lot of the time, lying in tatters and ruin, riddled by violence and war, beset by hurricane after forest fire after flash flood. It's filled with people who make pornographic films about children or who murder their colleagues in a blind rage, or who abuse their spouses. It's plagued by systems that favor the rich and the wealthy and the powerful at the expense of the down and out. There's a lot of rubbish. And it's hard when we look at that to even know where to begin. And then if we look to the church, to God's creative agents, his employees in the great building project, things don't look a whole lot more hopeful. We spend so much of our time yelling at each other, defending our little realms within the church, or we have relinquished the very things that make us unique, able to be builders, Letting go of these things, humility, love, forgiveness, justice, peace, as we flail about, grasping instead at those enticing offers of power and security and wealth and pride. No, on the face of it, the church doesn't seem to have a great track record of being fruitful, creative agents building up the kingdom of God. When we take a look around, all we see sometimes is the land in ruins, a kingdom filled with rubble and rubbish. 
and the taunts of Sanballat and Tobiah ring loudly in our ears. You actually think you can build something here? You think you can make something useful, something good, something beautiful out of this trash heap? You think your God is going to magically repair the damage that's been done? The walls you've built, the work you've done, the relationships you have established, the communities you have helped shape, all that is so tenuous, so fragile, we could knock it over with a single word, a single action. And we hear these taunts in our heads, and we, we wonder if they might be true. What's the point of any of it, we ask ourselves. What are we actually doing? What can we actually accomplish? Nehemiah knows how powerful such taunts can be. He knows that Sanballat and Tobiah pose real threats to the building project, that they could do real damage, whether just with their words or mockery or through action. So he goes to God. Hear, O our God, for we are despised. Turn their taunt back on their own heads and give them over as plunder in a land of captivity. Do not cover their guilt and do not let their sin be blotted out from your sight, for they have hurled insults in the face of the builders. Turn their taunts back on their own heads, he prays. And God apparently answers. Because right after this prayer, the narrator tells us, with no fanfare whatsoever, so we rebuilt the wall. And all the wall was joined together to half its height, for the people had a mind to work. Nothing miraculous happened. God did not smite down Sanballat and Tobiah. The bricks did not somehow become lighter, God did not fill the people with some superhuman strength. He just gave them a mind to work. And with that mind, they kept at it. One brick on top of another. One jar of mud mixed after another. One task after another. Until eventually the wall rose to their ankles, and then their knees, and then their shoulders, and then over their heads, half of the average 12 feet in height. And here's what I really love about this story, what we're told in chapter 3. We're given a, a whole list of the people and the families and the groups, all working on their own little section of the wall. The high priest Eliashib and his fellow priests rebuilt the sheep gate. The sons of Hassanah built the fish gate. Next to them, Merimoth, son of Uriah, son of Hakaz, made repairs. And next to him were the Tekoites, making their own repairs. Joida, son of Pasia, he tag-teamed with Meshulam, son of Besodiah, to repair the old gate. Jediah, son of Harumah, fixed up the wall opposite of his house, which makes sense. Malkijah, son of Harim, and his friend Hasub, son of Pahaf Moab, they repaired a section of the Tower of Ovens. Next to them was Shalom, son of Haloshesh, and he was ruler of half the district of Jerusalem. A ruler getting his hands dirty in all the repair work, working with, and I love this, his daughters. Each person, each family, each group looked to the work in front of them, the task in front of them, the work that they could do. And together, the sum of all these smaller projects, the wall takes shape. There is nothing miraculous about it. And there is everything miraculous about it. There is something deeply beautiful about it. 
And I know that if we looked beyond the surface, past all the big stories that clamor for our attention of everything that is wrong and broken and ruined in the world, we would see some deeply beautiful, miraculous things. If we gave all the taunts and the mockeries over to God and listened for him instead, we would hear stories of people doing what might seem like small, unassuming work, but which is all a part of something bigger, something beautiful, something marvelous, something kingdom-like. Stories of gardens being planted in run-down neighborhoods. Of meals being cooked for lonely people. Of stuffed sheep being hidden around the church for kids to find as they learn that God never leaves them. Of someone taking the time to listen to a friend's story, a story that person has held inside for so long of missionaries getting a card from home, reminding them that hundreds of people are praying for them, of a student getting a bagged lunch with a happy picture and an encouraging note written on it by someone they don't know, of lawns being mown and leaves being raked and sidewalks being shoveled, of warm hugs and soft knitted blankets and visits at the hospital and carols sung in nursing homes. It's a quote I've used before, but it's worth using again. From the very last paragraph of the novel Middlemarch, describing the character of Dorothea. Her full nature spent itself in channels which had no great name on the earth. But the effect of her being on those around her was incalculably diffusive. For the growing good of the world is partly dependent on unhistoric acts. And that things are not so ill with you and me as they might have been is half owing to the number who lived faithfully a hidden life and rest in unvisited tombs. It's easy. I know it, it is easy to get caught up in the loud, mocking voices and all the scenes of ruin and rubble. But for all these things might try to distract us or fill us with despair, they cannot stop the work God is doing in the world. Work he accomplishes through the small, seemingly unconsequential but no less beautiful and marvelous deeds of his people. So on this Labor Day weekend, may the Lord give you a mind to work. May he fill you with an enthusiasm and delight in the tasks before you. May he give you glimpses of the kingdom and fill you with hope so that together we might be used to be part of making something beautiful. Your labor is not in vain. Would you pray with me? And so, holy God, give us a mind to work. When things seem hopeless and dark, when the voices that cry out their taunts are loud, be louder. Be evident in our lives, reminding us that you are sovereign over all things and you are working out your purposes in your creation. And you have called us in your grace to be a part of that. May we have an energy and an enthusiasm and a delight in that work to which you have called us so that we might persist when things seem bleak. So we might be light where there is darkness. So we might stir people towards hope when they despair. 
And so that in all of these things, in everything we do, we might point others to the truth that you are sovereign, that you are good. Fill us with your spirit, O God, empowering us and equipping us. Bring us back to you again and again and again that we might be filled with your hope. And so, God, as we work for the good of our communities, we bring them before you, asking that your hand would be upon the places and people that we love and care about, the places we read about, places that are fraught with war and violence and division, with drought and hurricanes and wildfires and destruction, where people live uncertain lives. Work through your people, God. Work through the lives of those who would not even claim you as Lord. Be sovereign over your creation, God. We pray for those who are lonely, those who are despairing, those who are anxious, that you would make your presence near to them, comforting them, filling them with love and hope, We pray for those who are sick, who are recovering from surgeries, or who are anticipating upcoming procedures. We continue to pray for John Wanders, ask that you would give him peace and comfort and his family. We pray for Kurt DeYoung as he anticipates knee surgery this week. We ask that you would give all those who are recovering patience and healing and surround them with friends and family who bear your presence among them. God, as we now come to this table, use it to nourish us and strengthen us in our faith. We remember today the sacrifice of Jesus the Christ who ushered in in his life and death and resurrection the kingdom we now so eagerly await, the kingdom we work for. Go with us in the work that you have called us to do, God. We love you. We praise you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.
So friends, lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. With joy we praise you, gracious God, for you created heaven and earth, made us in your image, and kept covenant with us, even when we fell into sin. We give you thanks for Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was exalted as King of the universe, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow. Therefore, we join our voices with all the saints and angels and the whole creation to proclaim the glory of your name. We give thanks to God the Father that our Savior Jesus Christ, before he suffered, gave us this memorial of his sacrifice until he comes again. At his last supper, the Lord Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after the supper and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. For whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, we proclaim our faith as signed and sealed in this sacrament. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Lord our God, send your Holy Spirit so that this bread and cup may be for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. May we and all your saints be united with Christ and remain faithful in hope and love. Gather your whole church, O Lord, into the glory of your kingdom. We pray in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, I invite you to take out the cracker. Take, eat, remember and believe that the body of Christ was given for you. And take, drink, remember and believe that the precious blood of our Lord Jesus Christ was poured out for the complete forgiveness of all our sins. I invite you to rise now in body or in spirit. Since the Lord has fed us at his table, let us together praise his holy name with thanksgiving. Praise the Lord, O my soul. All my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion. Thy deep for me. 
before I give the benediction, I do have one last announcement to make, uh, which is that Noah, after some conversation and prayer and discernment and life changes, um, is feeling called in a new direction to do something I don't fully understand, but which I know involves writing and design and technology and a lot of the things Noah's really good at, and which he can do while still writing and creating for the church uh, in some capacity. And so he is going to be leaving us sometime towards the end of October. We're not quite sure yet when, um, but as we anticipate that, we wanted to let you know so we can be praying for him and Presley as they look for what's next. Um, we'll have a big old time to say thank you when we come to that date, but we've been reflecting a lot that certainly for such a time as this, Noah, I think, came to help us uh, during the pandemic, to help me during the pandemic. Um, and so we will certainly be praying for both of you um, as we go forward. We know that God goes with you. We know that God goes with all of us as we go into the work to which he has called us to do. So go with the blessing of our God. May God go before you to guide you. May God go behind you to protect you. May God go beneath you to support you and beside you to befriend you. Do not be afraid, but may the blessing of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit settle in among you and remain with you always. Do not be afraid, but go in peace to love and serve the Lord. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen.